going to show you something. It's a fun way that he uses to tell people about Jesus. And so go ahead, Titus. So what is this? Who likes flying paper airplanes? Well, sometimes you throw a paper airplanes. They either go long or they fall short. It's kind of like us because we've fallen short of the glory of God. And that's why he sent, like a postcard, Jesus to die on the cross so that we may have life and we give our life. We know we can go up in heaven to his heavenly house. And I know I'm going to heaven because... One day, I was reading the Bible, and I bumped into a verse that said, you have to forgive seven times 70. So I went to my mom, and we read the Bible. You don't have to forgive seven times 70. You just have to forgive in your heart. And that led to spiritual forgiveness. And then she asked me if I wanted to give my life to Jesus. And I said yes. And then I still remember some of the words I said. Hey, please help me. I'm sorry. Please be my boss. And amen. And that's how I know I'm going to heaven. How about you? All right, give Titus a hand. Now, Titus, that's a fun way that he likes to tell people about Jesus. And guys, when you get home, you know what? You can have fun telling people about Jesus. Don't make it harder than it is. Hey, who should be number one in your life? Jesus. Okay, I'm going to need a couple of volunteers, a couple of sponsors to help me out here. And so let me look around. I'm looking for a couple of guy sponsors. And so looking on, I tell you what, um, who should I choose? And you know, I've used a lot of these guy sponsors, right? Okay, who are we choosing? Danny, come on up here. Danny, you can give me a hand. And then let me get, uh, let me get another guy um, looking around this side. Okay, yeah, come on up here. Yeah, right here. Yeah, yeah, come on up here. All right, you guys come on up here. You're going to help me. Now, out of curiosity, I just need to make sure that you're not scared of fire. Are you okay with that? Danny, you're all right with that? Okay, it's David, right? David? All right, fantastic. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show them something. Guys, when you get home, I want you to know that there are two incredible ways that you can tell people about Jesus. Now, while I'm telling you about this, I'm going to take these uh, these sticks right here, and I'm going to soak them for just a second. And so what I need you to do, David, if you'll step to the side for just a second. Danny, I want you to stick out both arms, okay, like you're in an airplane right here. Okay, now he's got two arms sticking out right there, and I want you to know that when you get home, there are two things that are going to help you tell other people about Jesus, okay? And so on the one hand, in fact, David, while I'm talking, can you just can you just kind of kneel down right there and just hold those in there? All right, perfect, right there. On the one hand, you've got the words you say, okay? And on the other hand, you have the things you do. And so the words you say, everybody say the words I say, everybody say the things I do. Okay, now on Saturday, I'm flying to New York. I'm going to be on an airplane. So let's say I get on this airplane, and the pilot comes over, and he says, I've got good news and bad news. And he says, the bad news is we're going to lose a wing. The good news is we get to choose which one. Well, it doesn't matter which one we lose. We're going to crash either way, and your witness, you sharing Jesus... It's kind of like this too. Man, Danny, you are a tall person. Okay, kind of like this too. You see, if you do all the right things, but you never tell anybody why, they're just going to think you're a really good person. But if you say all the right things, I love Jesus, you can know Jesus, but you don't live for Jesus, they're going to look at you and say, why would I want what you have? I'm better than you are. So for you to share Jesus with your friends, it's the things you do and it's the words you say. Okay, Danny, put your hands down right there. All right, fantastic. Okay, David, all right. This is what I want you to do. I want you to hang on. I want you to hang on to this one right here. Hold on to that for a second. Danny, I want you to hold on to that one right there for just a second. And I'm going to put the lid back on this. The Bible says the moment you gave your life to Jesus. Like right when we came in here, a young lady came up to me and she told me that Last night, she gave her life to Jesus. Now, the moment she made that decision, an incredible thing happened. 
Because what happened is Jesus came into her life. He saved her. He adopted her into his family. She became a child of God. And the Bible says that she became a light to the world. Now we're going to pretend that this is the guy that came to camp. Now right now, this guy doesn't know Jesus. But he comes to camp and he hears about how Jesus died and he rose again. And you know what he decides? He decides that he wants to have Jesus in his life. And so he makes the same decision that some of you guys have made this week. And the moment he gives his life to Jesus, the Bible says he becomes the light of the world. In other words, he has the life and the love of Jesus, but it was never meant to be hidden or kept secret. It was meant to be shared. Two ways that it's shared. One way is by the things that you do. By the works of your hands, you pass that light to people who don't know Jesus. And now this person, because of how he lived, this person knows Jesus too. But now there's another guy over there. He doesn't know Jesus. Now this guy just lives good, but never tells him why. He's never going to know why. you got to, it's the things you do, and it's the words you say. Two ways that that light is passed. The things you do, the words you say, that's how your friends, that's how your family, that's how other people you know are going to hear about Jesus and be able to give their lives to Jesus the same way you did. But then let's say this guy right here. Let's say that he gets home from camp. And even though he knows Jesus, he gets scared. Because what if people tease him? And he decides, you know what? I'm not going to share my light. I'm going to hide it away. Now, is this light going to help anybody? Because he hid it away. But maybe this guy right here, instead of being afraid people are going to tease him, maybe his family doesn't go to church. And so when he gets home, it's just easier to go back to the way he was before. And when he goes back to the way he was before, you know what? His friends are not going to see Jesus. But then let's say this person keeps living for Jesus and someday their life comes to an end. But they lived for Jesus and they shared Jesus. Someday in eternity, there are going to be people there because they shined their light. The Bible says, you are the light of the world. This light... It was meant to be put on a hill where everybody can see. You don't light a lamp and hide it under a bushel. You put it on a lampstand so it gives light to everybody. If you guys know Jesus, when you go home, you can take everything you know about Jesus and you can pass that truth to your friends and family. All right, give them a hand for helping me. You guys can have a seat. Y'all did a great job. And I need some helpers. Let me see. There are some young ladies from... Omaha, Arkansas, and they showed me a video one of their sponsors did of them doing a song we've done up here a couple of times. Where are the ladies at from Omaha that were on that video? Right up here. All right, come on up here, ladies. All right, you guys are going to help me with a song. Two on this side, two on that side. You guys stand up. You'll remember the song. Yeah, come on this side right here. All right, here we go. You'll recognize it. Hey, guys, a blind man needs someone to show him the way. Now, Jesus is the way, but he's not going to find it unless someone shows him how. Here we go. Blind man stood by the road and he cried. Blind man stood by the road and he cried. Blind man stood by the road and he cried. But oh, oh, oh.
So this is what I want you to picture. I want you to picture Jesus, and he's kneeling down, and he's praying, and it's like he's sweating big old drops of blood, and then you see a crowd, and they've got swords and torches, and they've come to arrest him. And then Jesus goes, and he wakes up his disciples, and here comes the crowd, and, and they find out that they're going to come to take Jesus. Now, everybody look right up here. Did you know Peter? Okay, St. Peter that stepped out of the boat. When he found out they came to arrest Jesus, you know what he did? I mean, right there in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible says he pulls out a sword. He had a sword. He pulled out a sword and he, he cut off the ear of one of the servants, temple servants, that was in that crowd. I mean, he cut off his ear. Now, the chances are he wasn't aiming for his ear. You know, for all, he was probably aiming for his head. Maybe the guy moved. Peter was a fisherman. You know, we don't know. But he got his ear. Now, picture that. They came to arrest Jesus. Peter pulls out a sword, cuts off a guy's ear. Picture that guy. He's in pain. And you know what Jesus does? He does exactly the same thing that he will do anytime you're in that situation where you're like, God, what's happening? What, what should ha what's going to happen here? He steps into the middle. And guys, you know what he did? He looks at Peter and he says, Peter, those that live by the sword die by the sword. And then the Bible says he picks up that bloody ear and he takes it and he puts it back on that man's head. And that man is totally fine. He is healed. No more pain. No more blood. Guys, I don't know about you. If I was in that crowd and I'd come to take Jesus, I think I'd be going home. But they didn't. They arrested Jesus. The disciples ran away. And they put him up on trial. And all these people got up and told their stories about him. And finally, the high priest, he looks out and he says to Jesus, he says, are you the son of God? And Jesus said, I am. And as soon as he said, I am, Boy, that's blasphemy. I mean, he's putting himself on a level with God. He said, I am. The Bible says as soon as he said it, one of the temple guards stepped out and he punched Jesus because he claimed to be God's son. And there must have been an uproar. The Bible says they started to spit at him. And the Bible says they grabbed the whiskers of his beard and they yanked him out of his face. And at one point, the Bible says they covered Jesus' eyes and they would come up and they'd hit him. And they'd say, oh, if you're God's son, prophesy to me. In other words, if you're God's son, tell me my name, tell me who I am. That they beat him like that. And then the Bible says they took him to the governor because they didn't have the right to kill him. That's what they wanted to do. But they didn't do that because they were under the Roman rule. They were Jews, but the Romans were in charge. So they took Jesus to the governor. And the governor, his name was Pilate. He talked to Jesus. He couldn't find anything wrong. But all these angry religious leaders are going, he deserves to die. And so, so Pilate finds out Jesus is from up north. And so he sends him off to King Herod, who happens to be in town. Well, King Herod sends him back. And while the soldiers are watching this, they realize, here's a Jew. Now, these were Roman soldiers. They hated the Jews. Here's a Jew that even the Jews hate. And they call him the king of the Jews. And so these soldiers decide, you know what a king needs? A king needs a crown. And so the Bible says they take and they weave together this big old crown of thorns. And the Bible says they take that crown and they stick it on Jesus' head. I mean, big old thorns. You know, I saw one once. It's about that long, sharp as a nail. They take these thorns, they stick it on his head, then they take a stick. Because a king needs a crown, a king needs a scepter. It's a king of royalty. So he's got a crown of thorns on his head. He's holding a stick. And the Bible says these soldiers, they kneel down around him and they make fun of him. They pretend to worship him. And they say, oh, king of the Jews, we worship you. And they laugh at him and they make fun of him. And when they're done making fun of him, the Bible says they grab the stick out of Jesus' hands and they beat him on the head with it. Then they take him back to the governor. Now the governor, he thinks Jesus is innocent. But here's all these angry religious leaders. He deserves to die. And so he has Jesus beaten with a whip. Now, this whip was not any whip. It had nine ends. And on the end of each one of the ends were things that would bone and metal, things that would act like hooks. And so they'd take a person and they'd tie him up on a pole or in a doorway. And usually one soldier was in front and one in back. And they both had one of these, you know, this, this whip. And they would watch the breathing. Now, the reason they did this to people, it was never to kill them. 
In fact, it was unusual that they would whip somebody and then go kill them. Because the reason they did this was to beat a person to the point of death. And the rest of their lives, these people would walk around scarred, disfigured from head to toe. And everybody that would see them would say, huh, that's why you don't mess with the Romans. You mess with the Romans, that's what they do to you. And so they would have tied Jesus up and then stretched out where they pull his robe off. They're watching his breathing because if they do it at the wrong moment, they could kill him. And so these soldiers, they were trained, and at the right moment, as he's breathing, they'd swing in those nine ends and dig in, and he'd turn and pull, and then drag. And then the other soldier, and again, and again, and again, and these soldiers were taught that nobody could survive 40 lashes with this weapon. And so they beat Jesus 39 times. Now, he's not even to the cross. But guys, he is beaten almost to the point of death. Now they take Jesus, and they start taking him up to the skull-shaped hill. They're going to kill him between two criminals. And Jesus, and guys, this is the part that just grabs my heart. I mean, this is Jesus. He spoke the words, and everything existed. He healed the blind. He raised the dead. People that couldn't walk could walk. All power. But he is in a physical body just like you and me. And his body is so broken. The Bible says when they take that cross and they start leading him up, that Jesus, who spoke everything and it was, that he falls down because his body is so hurt and he is so beaten. He's so broken that the Bible says he can't carry his own cross. And these soldiers, they realize it. And they grab a guy from the crowd and they make him carry Jesus' cross. And they take Jesus up to this school-shaped hill and they would have laid him down and they would have put a nail, a nail through each hand and one through his feet. Now, when I was your age, I didn't understand how this killed somebody. You know, because they crucified a bunch of people like this. And, and it was the worst way they could find to kill somebody. It made people suffer. But I didn't understand, how does this make you suffer? Until somebody explained it to me. When they stretched you out, you know what they do? They'd stretch you out in such a way that for you to get a breath of air, you would have to pull your body weight up on those nails and push up on that nail through your feet <sighs> just to be able to get a breath of air. <sighs> Every breath, you're pulling yourself up on nails. And then if you, lived, if you were up there too long, eventually your arms would get paralyzed because they would get too tired. And you'd be pushing on that one nail through your feet every breath. And if you lived too long, soldiers would come along and break your legs. You'd die. Now, they didn't break Jesus' legs. He was perfect in every way. But for six hours on that cross, he pulled himself up on nails. Because that's how much he loves you. He could have brought himself down. He healed others' pain. He could have taken his own pain away. But if he would have called a million angels and just been done with it all, there's not a person in this room or this world that would have any chance of going to heaven. This was the price that had to be paid to make a way to save us from our sins. He was being punished for all the bad things that you and I would ever do. And finally, Jesus looks out and he says, it's finished. Paid in full. And Jesus died. And for three days, he was dead. His body was in a grave. But then he didn't stay dead. He rose again. And he beat death. And he beat sin. And he beat all these wrong things that you and I have ever done and he made a way to save us. He rose again and he's alive and he is in this room right now. And not only is he in this room, here's the cool thing. He knows everything about you. He knows your name. In fact, before you were even born, before, before, he even made the world. 
He already knew your name. And he already loved you. And he already had plans for your life. You see, when God calls you to something, it's not because he just decided to do it. It's because he made you for it. Guys, Jesus gave his all to make a way to save you from your sin. Everybody say, but God showed his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I want to show you one last thing. When Jesus was on the cross, I told you that there were two criminals next to him, one on each side. Now that's what these cups represent right here. Now I don't know what those criminals had done, but whatever they had done, it was pretty bad because they had been sentenced to death. Now I want you to just picture this. I'm going to take one drop. Can I put one drop in there? Now from a distance, y'all probably can't see that. See, from a distance, it's easy to hide your sin. But can you hide it from God? God sees everything. But most of us, even though we're probably not as bad as these guys right here, we've all done wrong things. And these two criminals, they've done wrong things. But they were very different from each other too. Because you see, on the cross, as these three were dying, Jesus in the middle, a criminal on each side. As they were dying, one of them looked at Jesus and he said, save yourself and save us too. In other words, get us down with you. But the other criminal, he said, don't you get it? We're dying for the wrong things we've done. This man is innocent. And then he turns to Jesus and he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You see, the difference between these two criminals was not that one was better than the other. The difference between them was one was willing to put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And the moment a person, no matter how good, because good people need Jesus too, or how bad, the moment you come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm sorry for all the wrong things I've done. I want you to come into my life, take my sins away. The moment you give your life to Jesus, but Jesus comes into your life and he'll take every wrong thing that you have ever done and faster than even that. Jesus, because he died for your sins, because you rose again, only Jesus can take your sins away. You see, these two criminals are like everybody in the world. Because everybody, all of you, you're just like, you're one of these two. Right now, you're either saved because you've given your life to Jesus, or you're not. Right now, you're either going to heaven because Jesus is your Lord and Savior, or you're not. Every one of you is one of these two right here. And guys, tonight, if you're not certain that you're going to heaven, in a moment, your sponsors are going to stand right over there, and you can go over, and you can talk to them. But this is not just about you. This is also about the people you know at home. Everybody you know, whether it's your family, or your friends, or your coach, or your teacher at school this last year, or the lady that greets you when you walk in Walmart. Every one of them is one of these two people. They're either saved or lost, going to heaven or not. They're one of these two. Which one are you?